You have a good week? Yeah. I didn't have a very good week, pain wise, but there was two wonderful, caring men rang me up during the week to see how I was going. I was concerned about that car crash that apparently I had without even realising it. How kind of it. So I launched into a hellfire and brimstone gospel and risk and they were gone before I could finish the first sentence. Maybe I should start with forgiveness first and maybe I should be listening. But you can sometimes have a really good conversation and share the gospel with people who are just ringing up trying to sell you something. An opportunity some of us people get who are very old and stuck at home in bed most of the time. Thank you, Rene. Several weeks ago, we looked at Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2, and I only got to verse 1. Today, we look at verse 2. So let's pray first. Father, we just ask that you will bless this time. May what your words be spoken, may we be hearers of your words, and not only hearers, but doers of them. We just ask for your guidance now, in Jesus' name, Amen. Hebrews chapter 12, reading verses 1 and 2. I'll read verse 1. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. And let us run up endurance, the race that is set before us. And that's pretty much where we got to. A great cloud of witnesses are those in the previous chapter. It begins with therefore. All those Old Testament faithful saints who by faith lived their lives as a testimony. And we spoke about the fact that it was not a case of them looking down from heaven and observing us as some thing, but rather the testimony that is recorded of their lives as an example for us to follow. We looked at quite a number of things about what is a witness and too many notes here. We looked at the fact that angels do observe us and that should affect our conduct. To lay aside all that hinders us is the weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Lay it aside and the emphasis is to physically pick it up, separate it from us and put it somewhere behind us and move forward. We have to run Rip endurance, the race that is set before us. There's times to go slow, be slow to anger. There's times to be still, be still and know that I am God. There's times to wait on the Lord, doing nothing except for Him to reveal His will. Times to be silent, be still and know that I am God. Times of urgency to share the gospel message to those who are dying. There are times to flee. Flee from these things, Paul says, he's talking about the love of money. There are times to be prepared, always be prepared to give an account of the hope that is in you. <coughs> and then we came to those three precious words, looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. I love those words and the, the key three words in this whole passage. The Amplified to a hunch, but I've got to read it first, haven't I? It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. The Amplified translation is one that simply emphasises the Greek meaning. And it says, looking away from all that will distract to Jesus. Just as a runner in a race must keep his or her eyes on the finishing line, so also must believers keep their eyes on the prize at the end of the race, the Lord Jesus. Well, they'll lose direction, stumble and fall, and lose their hope of reaching the finishing line. Our encouragement comes from constantly looking unto Jesus. Not just a quick glance over our shoulder or a quick glance heavenward, but having our eyes of faith firmly fixed upon Jesus. 
Some examples in Scripture. In Matthew 7, 82 to 3, the disciples saw a vision of the transfigured and glorified Christ. It says, His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Moses is one of those witnesses mentioned in chapter 11. Elijah it comes under the, the word, the prophets, the Old Testament prophets. Looking unto Jesus, Stephen looked unto Jesus as he was being stoned and put to death. We read in Acts chapter 7, 55, But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Matthew 18, 20 is another example. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, I, Jesus, am there in the midst of them. This morning we've been looking unto Jesus on the cross of his broken body. We've been looking unto Jesus in the precious shed blood. We've been looking unto Jesus as in that tomb for three days and three nights. We've been looking unto Jesus as he sat on the stone that was rolled away. And we've been looking unto Jesus as he ascended into heaven because we remember him in this way until he comes again. So as Christians, what do we do? How do we look unto Jesus? Well, of course, we shut our eyes and we walk around, gaze heavenward. Open our eyes expecting to see Jesus and of course we'll crash into everything. We'll all end up in hospital and we'll all have a good conversation there. No, it's far more than that. He is in the midst this morning because wherever two or three are gathered, he is here. He has heard every thought, every word of praise and worship that has been uttered, whether silent or audible. We are to look unto him in every circumstances of our life. Because the Lord Jesus is our example. It says, For I, Jesus, have given you an example that you should do as I have done. John 13, 15. As the Lord in humility washed his disciples' feet. Are we characterised by humility just as Jesus was? If we look unto him throughout our lifetime in all circumstances, we'll become more and more like him. Looking unto Jesus, for to this you are called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. Christ is the example for us, no matter what the circumstances of life might be. And you see that example in the closing words of that passage where he spoke about the joy that was before him. Because of that he endured the shame and despised the cross. What was that joy? The joy of having you and I in heaven eternally with him. He was on your mind as he went and was nailed to that cross. He knew you. He knew you were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. And he went there in love for you and I. Looking unto Jesus, the one by whom Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me in Philippians 4.13. Looking unto Jesus, who said in Matthew 28, 20, For I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He will always be with us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Look unto him in every circumstances in life, in the dark times, the troubled times, and in the times of joy. Look unto Jesus. He is the supreme example in all things. Study the gospel accounts and meditate on how Jesus reacted in all the circumstances of his public ministry. Whether it was to the poor, whether it was to the rich, whether to the Jew, the Gentile, those who were steeped in sin or the religious leaders. And then meditate. Think about it. How you can learn from him in the circumstances. How did he speak to each in different individual. To the woman caught in the very act of adultery, he first dealt with the accusers and wrote on the ground in the sand. We don't know what he wrote, but I have a feeling it might have been a list of all their sins that they'd recently committed because they departed one by one. Then he said to this woman, neither do I condemn you. He reached out in love first. 
You might the next time I scan a rings, I need to reach out in love rather than talking about hell first, and I might be more successful. But then he said to that woman, go and sin no more. There was no condoning of sin. But in every example in the Gospels, look at who he's talking to, how he interacted to them. Because you see, people need Christ today. Circumstances in the world have changed greatly, but the deepest needs of mankind are still exactly the same. And we need to look under Jesus and share his message with them. To sum up, and I'll simply put a few of these thoughts together. Looking unto Jesus who is glorified in heaven, yet in our midst also as an example to follow. And is the one through whom I can do all things, and the one who will be with me always until I am called home to heaven. If your gaze is constantly looking unto Jesus, you'll find it almost impossible to sin. Remember that sin that so easily ensnares us. The more we are looking unto Jesus, the more we'll be able to resist that temptation to sin. If you'd like to know a lot more about looking unto Jesus, I found an article by a man called Theodore Mono, who's a French pastor, and in 1874, he wrote this wonderful article about looking unto Jesus. If you'd like to know more about it, I'll happily email it to you. I've only got one copy here, but I can send it to you if you'd like to have it. Then it goes on to speak about the author and the finisher of our faith, that is, Jesus. The author, the Greek word is archigos or something or other, I can't pronounce it, but it signifies one who takes a lead in or provides the first occasion of anything, the leader, the source. But Jesus is more than that to us. He is the author or originator of eternal salvation unto all them who obey him, Hebrews 5, 9. He is the concrete and active cause of our salvation. He is, as his name Jesus implies, our salvation himself. Luke 2.30. It's a quote from W.E. Vine. Is the Lord Jesus the author of your salvation? Can you go back to that time when recognising that you were lost in a sinful state by faith? Just as those Old Testament saints, you committed your life to him, asking forgiveness of sins. Because if he is the author of your salvation, he will also be the finisher, or in some translations, the perfecter of your faith. The word perfect has a sense of going on to completeness, going on to maturity, and will ultimately be perfected when we see Jesus face to face. The Amplified Translation again says, looking away from all that will distract to Jesus, who is the leader and the source of our faith, giving the first incentive for our belief, and is also its finisher, bringing to maturity and perfection. If Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith, Throughout our Christian pathway, how can we possibly lose our salvation, as is sometimes taught? <coughs> Philippians 1, 16. Philippians 1 says, 16 says, He who has a begun a good thing in you, how shall he not also finish it or complete it until the day of Jesus Christ? So having begun the work of salvation, he'll be there as the leader throughout that whole period. And he will finish it 
and that will finish in triumph as we are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. We know that in that journey, Satan will oppose us every step of the way, but by constantly looking unto Jesus, the author of our salvation, he will see us through. 2 Corinthians 1.21 says that now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. 2 Corinthians 5.5 5 says almost the same thing. Ephesians 1, 13 to 14. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. 2 Timothy 1, 12. For this reason I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. That day is the day when Christ returns. The trumpet shall shout, sound, the voice of an archangel, the assembling shout, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, the living who remain, shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. The Lord Jesus in John 10 very emphatically said, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. They shall never perish does not mean that you might perish and lose your salvation if you don't live up to all the fullness of God's standards. We all fail, we all sin at times but there is no possibility of losing our salvation. They shall never perish. The words of Jesus means exactly that. He has promised it. It is written as a guarantee, as it were, in his own precious blood shed on the cross of Calvary. And he says, Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. That's pretty complete, I think. There's no need to argue with that. But then Jesus utters some more words just to emphasise the assurance. He says, My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hands. That is the absolute assurance to every believer in <coughs> Jesus Christ, that as Christ is the author of our salvation, he will also be the perfecter of our salvation. There are many verses in the Bible that taken in isolation and out of context sound like you can lose your salvation. But a good look at the context soon shows this to be not the case. Some 30 years ago, as we were here the first time, I wrote two articles. One looking at all the scriptures relating to the assurance of our salvation that can and will never be lost and another one looking at all the different scriptures that are sometimes used and sometimes mislead people to fear that they might have lost their salvation. I spent many a night with a brother in Christ doing tears, weeping that he had lost his salvation. And you could reassure him by the words of Jesus that he would never, never, ever perish. What God has promised, he will keep. That does not mean that we are to sit back and simply do nothing once we are saved. There is a sanctifying process to go through all our life. There is a work to do. He has given each of us different gifts. There is a race that is set before us. It, might be, it will be different for each one here. And we have to run with endurance that race that Jesus Christ has set before us. It is not feet up on the deck chair and relax and do nothing, but rather looking unto Jesus, be active in service out of love for him. There's no such thing as retirement for a Christian. However old and feeble we may get, we can still live our lives as a witness for the Lord who loved us and gave himself for us.
I just want to read a, a few closing words from this article I spoke about. It says, looking unto Jesus as long as we remain on the earth. Looking unto Jesus from moment to moment without allowing ourselves to be distracted by memories of the past which we should leave behind us. Nor by occupation of the future of which we know nothing. Looking unto Jesus now if we have never looked unto him. Looking unto Jesus afresh if we have ceased to do so. Looking unto Jesus only. Looking unto Jesus still. Looking unto Jesus always with a gaze more and more constant, more and more confident, changed into the same image from glory to glory. 2 Corinthians 3.18 And thus awaiting the hour when he will call us to pass from earth to heaven and from time to eternity. The promised hour, the blessed hour, when at last we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he really is. During the week, I read a comment that struck me. And it said that he who has, or she, any person who has spent five minutes in heaven will know more than every commentator put together on earth. And that really struck me. What is in store for us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ when these feeble eyes, in these lowly bodies, when our bodies are changed like unto Christ's glorious body and we are in his presence for all of eternity, we'll learn more in five minutes than we could in a lifetime here. God has something wonderful in store for us. <coughs> Make sure you have looked unto Jesus for salvation. Be reassured this morning that he will see you all the way through, no matter what dangers you may face, no matter how many times you may fall into that trap of sin. We can confess our sins and he will forgive us. And he will see us through. He will perfect our faith. That glorious day, when we see Jesus face to face. There is so much more that could be said, and if you'd like to receive that article, I'll email it to you. I've got one copy here you can have, but it's well worth reading. Just reading one bit at a time, and meditating on it, looking unto Jesus. Closing verse this morning is 2 Timothy 4, 7 to 8. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. As we run with endurance the race that is set before us, putting aside sin, May our eyes be more firmly fixed on Jesus day by day and put into practice everything we see and everything we learn as we look constantly unto our blessed Son. Father, we thank you for a salvation that is so wonderful, so full and so free. Help us to live our lives as a reflection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to meditate on him more and more day by day, that we might be more and more like him as we reach out to those around us, to those who are heading for a Christless eternity. Father, give us that burning desire, we pray, to speak to others about their need for salvation through Jesus Christ alone. Be with us and go with us, we pray, and strengthen us. As we look under Jesus this week, we ask him in his worthy and precious name. Amen.